Professor Daniel Sinstra. Thank you very much. First thing to say is I feel uh, very excited and also very humble to be here. I really hope I can make a contribution uh, to this. And the other thing I have to say is I always feel I'm standing on three legs. Um, one leg is medicine. Um, just to give you the background, I graduated in, in Amsterdam and then very quickly became a designer in industry. So leg two is design and industry and have been part of some successes and many more failures. And really to understand the failures, the third leg was to look at academia, to universities, to find out uh, how we can learn from failures and to improve. And I really want to talk about um, community health care innovation labs to get that, that idea across. So on the one hand, the experience we're doing in Cranfield is very much about affordable health care, affordable diagnostic, affordable therapies and prevention, but you can't do that in isolation. That means you have to also design the pathways, you have to design the services, and you end up very much having to design healthcare uh, systems. So we're very focused on disruptive technologies. We're focusing in Cranfield on visualization, modeling and simulation, um, to understand pathways and to model and design pathways, and also obviously on co-design involving all the stakeholders in this. Now, I shouldn't really have to do this, but it's, I think it's good to position healthcare technology. Healthcare processes are about diagnosis, are about therapy, are about prevention, and also about care. And technology enables all of that. Um, so it's, it, it's useful, I think, to understand um, how technology has de developed and really challenging um, is, is technology helping us or is technology uh, obstructing us in delivering healthcare? Now, this is a difficult statistic, difficult diagram. I'm colorblind, so it's, it's difficult anyway. But this is research from the King's Fund in London. And this is really showing that GDP is almost meaningless. Increasing GDP in the Western world, in Europe, in the UK, in America, doesn't provide better healthcare. In fact, it's quite the opposite. So this is showing current spending on healthcare and econ that's what economists do. They try and project what's going to happen in the future and saying, guess what, the future, all the countries in the EU are trying to spend more money on healthcare. And we know that in the EU, we know very much in the, in the US, and look at the US, the US is spending more than 15% of GDP on healthcare. We know that many people in America do not have access to healthcare. So focusing on GDP itself doesn't bring better healthcare at all. The interesting thing that um, they also found was, guess what? The source of increased cost in healthcare is very much technology. It's, it's more than anything, 40, 60 percent and so on. So this is where people like me started from a long time ago. Clinicians delivered healthcare in the community. And look what technology has done to that. Technology came up with more expensive drugs, more expensive devices, in order to make that work, we need more expertise, we need more training, more expensive training, we need more expensive infrastructure, and before you know it, healthcare ended up here, in what I call the temples of technology. To experience good healthcare, you need to go into hospital, and that is not sustainable anywhere. So we need to do things differently. So still looking at technology then, Within technology, we can differentiate incremental technology, and you will recognize the stethoscope. It's a great example of small steps improving continuously the stethoscope. You recognize stuff like this, CT scanners, um, radical technology. I think what is more relevant is probably disruptive technology. This is one of the few examples of disruptive healthcare technology is a hard stand and it basically means you don't need a very experienced, very expensive heart surgeon to open you up and have the risk of open heart surgery and infection. Now a much cheaper interventional cardiologist can do this, implant the stand which far less cost and less risk. I think this is useful to read out. I'm sorry, I'm going to read it out because I think it's relevant. So this is where disruptive innovation was first described in Harvard in the US. 
And they're saying that disruptive innovations enable a larger population of less skilled, less wealthy people to do things in a more convenient, lower cost setting, which historically could only be done by specialists in less convenient settings. Well, clearly, that is relevant to where we are today. So what we really need to do is start off differently and say we need to drive effective local healthcare in rural areas. When people are healthier, they are going to get wealthier too and have a different spiral of health, wealth and well-being. So break through the current technology spiral into a well-being spiral. Now this is hugely complex. There are many, many challenges that we have to be faced, facing in, in doing this. Now, um, for instance, to go a little bit more in details, here you see a typical health te technology values chain. Starts off with the manufacturers. You got health policy driving that down. You got health e economics. You got um, sales and marketing procurement regulatory frameworks and so on. And all of these different stakeholders have different needs and different requirements. It's our challenge to meet all of these different things. And it's actually very, very, very complex. So Cranfield is doing many things. And I'll pick out one little case study. So we found this device a couple of years ago. Um, and this could be a disruptive innovation. So this is a portable ultrasound device. And we found out Although it's small, although it's portable, although it's affordable, it's not a success at all. It's not being used. So why is it not being used? We found out because people don't have the skills. They solve the wrong problem. The problem is not to make it portable. The, the problem is do you, how do you get people to, to get the skills to use this technology? So they solve the wrong problem. So what we then did in Cranfield is try and solve the, the other problems around this. So we said, okay, let's come up with an app to give people that aren't skilled in ultrasound to give them decision support. So give them reference libraries of images, tell them where to put this device, how to get started, and so on. But we also did it at Cranfield, and then you capture these images, and you can communicate this, and find out if this is a patient that um, you can deal with in the community or if you have to refer them on to more specialist help. What we also did was, was mapping the pathways and say if you introduce this potential innovation, how is the pathway going to change? What are the costs associated with the change of this pathway? What are the benefits uh, for the system, for the patients and so on for changing this pathway? So we're not developing new scientific technologies, we're developing the peripheral, the enabling technologies to make this stuff work. Um, so I think this is where, where we're sort of at. We're saying, okay, you want to innovate. And, and, and this is where you are today. You've got all sorts of stuff going on today. The first thing you need to do, importantly, is have a shared dream. You know, what is your dream about healthcare? Share that first. And then it is obviously about developing new products, but also developing organizations also developing new business models, also developing new processes, and guess what? Also developing new services. And you cannot do this in an ivory tower. You have to start off with very much engaging with the, the end user. And guess what? All of these things you have to do at the same time, simultaneously. You can't stick to just one dimension. And then I'm so pleased that it was mentioned before. Obviously, it's about co-design and co-creation. We can't do it to people. People, we can facilitate people to do it for themselves. Um, so we got into co-creation as well, and this is the starting point. So this is the wrong starting point. So it's not taking high tech, expensive tech, and making it low cost. That's the wrong starting point. The starting point has to be where are people, understanding people, working with these people, and getting them to a different, better well-being. So the starting point has to be different. And I think what I mentioned before, the community healthcare innovation labs are about, it sounds a bit economics speak. I'm not an economist, as you know, 
I'm a designer, medic, etc. But it is, I think, about four forms of capital. One is fiscal capital, so it's about new products. It's about new services, new infrastructure, in communities, in rural areas. It's about developing human capital in rural areas, so it's new capacities, new capabilities, new skills. It's about social capital, it's about increasing trust and collaboration, and it's about intellectual capital, capital new knowledge and learning. Um, so I think there's two direct imminent opportunities for the research, research councils in the UK, uh, one uh, for the EPSRC and one for the um, Arts and Humanities Research Council. And what we want to see, I think, in Cranfield and you all is action. Um, so we're here to build partnerships. Come and talk to Raj, come and talk to me. Um, and it's not just about talking. Talking is just the beginning. It's very much about how do we build action? How do we build partnerships? We would love to approach communities, find out pilots, work with, with pilots, identify target diseases. Diabetes is a global issue. Alzheimer's is a, is a global issue. Let's find targets that are relevant to the UK, that are very relevant to India, relevant to Europe, and relevant to, to the rest of the world. Establish proof of concept, and then scale up and spread. Okay? Thank you. <laughs>